Hi, I'm Bridgine McManus. Thanks for tuning in to this three-part podcast for the NSPCC. As a school teacher, I have always been interested in the welfare of children and I wanted to create these podcasts to raise awareness of who the NSPCC are, what they do and how they're looking after you. It is so important to raise awareness of such a wonderful organisation and hopefully for someone somewhere, this will enable you to reach out if you need help. Joining me on this podcast series is the lovely Margaret Gallagher, Head of Local Campaigns in the NSPCC. Margaret, welcome. How are you keeping today? I'm great and delighted to be here with you. It is so lovely to have you here. We are we are very privileged to have you here with your expertise and your knowledge. Um, just we'll start off obviously wondering how have you got to be part of the NSPCC? How did you get into it and, and a bit about your job and what you do? Well, Bridging, I suppose it took a number of years for me to get to this place. Um, I had a number of different roles and communities and I suppose that's where I would start off by saying I come from a very strong community development background. Mm-hmm. I've been involved in volunteering since I was a teenager, mm-hmm. then moved in to do other work. Um, my career wasn't a straightforward path, uh, but my passion always was about trying to help communities and children and young people. So um, like yourself, I taught for a short period of time, but older young very people. Good. And then I moved into the area of uh, managing a counselling service, which brought me to see that there were challenges in people's lives mm-hmm. that really were difficult and that we need to support people as early as possible to help with that. And that was with adults. Yes. Um, and then I moved to work with Women's Aid, where again, I was seeing a very, very challenging issue, which is mm-hmm. domestic abuse and violence. Yeah. And seeing the impact on families um, and particularly on children. And that's really where led me to the NSPCC. Um, I always had respect for them. Uh, we worked alongside them with all the other places I had worked previously. I found them very open, but it took me then to a place when the job became available around campaigns mm-hmm. where I could kind of marry up both those experiences I had of doing communications work, but also looking at preventing child abuse uh, and neglect. And I've been here 12 years and I have to say it's flown by, which is always a really, really good sign. And But I work with many partners and, and I love it. That is absolutely lovely. I, I think from what you're describing, it, it seems your journey was nearly meant to be and you needed to do the other things to get to where you are at now because all that experience has brought you to be a very, very, you know, a very knowledgeable person and, and to be able to actually put in place things that are going to help because you've seen it, you've been there, you've seen it you, you've and then you've seen it when you put things in action, how they can actually help as well. Yeah, I think that for me, there are many agencies working together, mm-hmm. but we have to work with the public as well. Oh, definitely, yeah. Those that hold the most insight into what's going on in families' lives and communities are often people who might be coming to the door yeah. to deliver groceries, mm-hmm. particularly now during COVID. Mm-hmm. So for me, mm-hmm. I, you know, those that are teachers, social workers, yeah. police, they're quite clear about their role. They're quite clear about their responsibilities. Mm-hmm. But often we have people in the community and young people themselves that don't know what to do. So a lot yes. of my work now is around trying to help support communities to act earlier yes. when they have concerns about a child and for anyone who is experiencing difficulties to come forward earlier and get help. So I think you have to remain positive and strength-based. It is a challenging subject, but I think if we're all in this together, it makes it easier to talk about this and I'm delighted that's why I'm here today. Yeah, very good. And I totally agree. And, and that actually really very nicely leads us into talking about really what child abuse is because there are many people who are maybe experiencing child abuse that don't realize they are and so we're going to maybe I'm going to ask you maybe now to talk a bit about you know what is is abuse in the home how does it occur um and and obviously as well what do the NSPCC do do to help children overcome that abuse well I suppose you know, if we look at a definition of abuse, and it can be difficult for people to hear that, but it is reality that for some children, um, they can be physically harmed, sexually harmed, Mm -hmm. um, and it can be emotional as well. Mm -hmm. And it can happen in person or online. So we talk about the home, but it can also happen in the community. Um, And it can be a lack of love and care and attention, which is actually neglect. So it is child abuse and neglect that we talk about. And there are different ways in which uh, children and young people Uh, can be affected by it and we have services ourselves and many other agencies provide support as well but what we need to know is that we need to recognise when child abuse Mm -hmm. and neglect is happening um, and intervene as early as possible. So what the NSPCC do um, 
we were formed over 130 years ago so it has evolved my goodness that's yeah. amazing you, people don't realize how long this institute this is this has been going you know mm. yeah and, we, and, and we're lucky because we have learned through moving through the different stages of when when things when children weren't so much protected mm-hmm. um and we're now in a good place to know that you know like physical punishment mm-hmm. is, is harmful yes um we know that children are much more looked after now in terms of their rights um and i suppose we're in a good place now to really try and drive down as much and prevent as much of this abuse as possible mm-hmm. so what we do is we have services ourselves across northern ireland we have three service centers but they specialize in sexual abuse and prevent sexual abuse as well and that is a difficult issue um and we work with children and their families to recover from that and to look at the future because we know that for many young people um, and children it is a, a a challenge and, and very difficult experience to have and for their parents or carers uh, to help them through. How do they move past this? Yes. So a lot of our focus is on the future. One of our programmes is called Letting the Future In. So that's the kind of work we do around abuse in itself. We have a helpline service for adults mm-hmm. and it's been running for a long time and it's a phone number as well as uh, email contacts as well. I don't know, we'll give out the details later. And that's for anyone who has concerns about a child. Yes, I think I think funny that is nearly for the adult. It's very hard to maybe to know what to actually do when you see or you suspect that this is going on. And for an adult then to have to, you know, to have to wonder, well, where do I go? Where, who do I go to and how do I do it in the appropriate way? You know, so you would obviously have that helpline for the adults as well to then help the children. Isn't that what you're what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, and it could also be neighbours or people in the community yeah. who've yeah. seen a pattern, maybe a behaviour of children being left on their own. Um, I've written a number of reports on Northern Ireland's cases that came to our helpline. And we'd often have like house parties where there's very young babies. Yes. Um, drug and alcohol misuse. Mm-hmm. It, it can be children, again, maybe because the parents are working mm-hmm. and there's financial difficulties mm-hmm. that the children have been left with inappropriate supervision, mm-hmm. children looking after other children. Um, or it can be, it could be the mental health and well-being of the parents, yes. them not being in a, in a place to parent. Uh, their capacity has been uh, affected by that. And really, we do have a lot of contacts from neighbours and friends. It could be grandparents mm-hmm. uh, who've seen that maybe something has changed within that family dynamic. Maybe the family's you know, not coming to visit them so much. And particularly with COVID now, we know that that yes. big concern. Uh, a lot of other family members, if, if families are struggling, will come in and support them. Yes. And that's why it's even more crucial now that we get support to families during this time because it is really, really hard for families to get support into their homes and, you know, for the limited... Uh, services we have for them to know who needs them mm-hmm. most so that's the kind of thing we do with the helpline um you can ring it anonymously yeah oh that's very good for yeah. people to know because i know not everybody would feel comfortable maybe you know putting their name to it because they're scared of repercussions or scared it's going to say if it's for example a family member who's wanting to find you know wanting to have to say this about another family member that makes a very difficult situation at times yes and that's why i suppose Whilst we would prefer people would tell us, so it gives yes. us more accurate information. But at the same time, you nearly can run through a scenario with us, talk yes. through, and also talk to us about what you might do about it. Mm-hmm. So it's not a report and helpline. Yes. You know, you can tell us things you want action to happen. We will give take action on your behalf. Yeah. But we'll also give you advice about just how would you approach that where you could still maybe have the relationship yes. there. Um, or it might be the person yourself, you know you're struggling, maybe you're living in a situation where there's violence in your home and you're, mm-hmm. you're experiencing that mm-hmm. and you know it's impacting on your children. So again, it might be help and signpost you to your nearest services. So we're, you know, I think we have a lot of experience around that and I know that that is really helpful. So where do children and young people go to to get this information and get this help well for us we've been running Chiline now uh, it's part of the service ANS PCC mm-hmm. uh, a long time we've merged with Chiline and it is a fantastic service because not only can you talk to us the way it used to be everybody has a, a vision of Chiline being a phone line yes. but we have messaging we have the website and the website is absolutely incredible in terms of the guidance that we can give children and young people um, and it's all designed with children and young people's input. Yes. So we're talking to children and young people how they want to be spoken to. That's fantastic because back at when, um, in, in my time, I suppose, I'm a 
don't want to show my age or anything but back when I was younger I remember Thailand just being that a line a phone number it has clearly evolved for any child that is suffering abuse it has clearly evolved as you say it's gone with the times where they can access this information through um as you say the website and is there social media elements to it yeah, as well yeah well with, well, with- Facebook, but that's kind of getting yeah. older now you for know, the older I know, people. I know, it changes so uh, but Instagram would be yes. a big one. We have our own YouTube channels. Fantastic. So, you know, children might want to read stuff. They might no. be too young or yes. say er, there's issues there around um, accessibility. Yeah. Then go on to YouTube and watch videos with YouTubers who are uh, people yes. who work with us. Brilliant. So we'll pick different themes and every mm-hmm. week new content goes up. So, you know, if we're coming up to this time of year, if we're looking at November, December, we'll be beginning to think about things like Christmas being difficult mm-hmm. at home. Uh, how do you cope with maybe you know yeah. that? How this year? How it might be different? Or exam times? We'll talk about exam stress mm-hmm. and that. Or you know uh, this week coming up as well. There's bullying week mm-hmm. as well. So mm-hmm. anti-bullying week. So we theme those out and um, we work with children and young people to, to find out what's how to reach them best. And in fact, uh, younger children are contacting us more now to the point that we've had to separate out and have a primary school website um, because some of the content that's on our main child mm-hmm. website will be a bit older than what they would need to see because we are talking about relationships yes. and maybe issues, mental health issues that would just be details that wouldn't be no, good for them, their, their age and development. So we've got the childland.org.uk forward slash kids for primary school oh, kids. Lovely. Because again, we do have children, not regularly, but children seven, eight, nine who are coming on to our website to find out about things that are happening in their home and to get guidance. Uh, but ultimately, what we want for children to know is we'll always be there for them. Yeah. Um, we have a really unique model in that we have volunteers and you can volunteer with Childline from your 16 plus. Uh, we don't need any specific qualifications or abilities other than that you have the right attitudes and sort of behaviours around children and young people be able to listen to them. So it's a great volunteer and opportunity. We have two bases in one in Derry and Foil uh, and one in Belfast. So, you know, uh, we love having younger people involved yeah. because they're so in touch with what's happening in young people's lives. So again, Childline, I would say, is, you know, a fantastic resource and um you know they're volunteers i just have absolute admiration for them because they come to us and they stay with us years and uh, you know some may stay for a year or two some may be there 10 but we couldn't do it without them and their ability to support children we hear about it from children it's just amazing but also young people support each other there's a part on the website it's a peer the main website is a peer messaging board uh where all our young people talk about topics and themes and give each other advice and uh that's brilliant as well so i definitely agree the connections and uh, between young people is so important and it definitely i think it's brilliant the way that you're as an organization tailing are honing in on that as well um well moving on as well now to obviously people confuse say child abuse with with certain other terms um there are there's a, there's so many levels to to child abuse and neglect and, and poverty are, are two words which are also very well known in, in society um and obviously I, I would like just because there's there are children out there who maybe don't realize that neglect is also a form of, of abuse but poverty is a different obviously a, d- a different side to things and so i just want you to kind of clarify for anybody listening what neglect is first of all because there might be some a, a child out there listening to this who, who's feeling that things aren't really sitting right with them in their lives and maybe this would help them to understand that there's a bit of neglect that is going on in their life and that's that's very difficult for a child isn't it and then obviously we can move on to talk about the difference between that and, and poverty because there is a clear difference between the two even though maybe people may confuse them would that be right in thinking that yeah, there's there's a relationship between them. Yes. But um, and if I look at neglect first. Yes. So I think um, and we have a neglect strategy in Northern Ireland from the Safeguarding Board that, that I would work on to support through awareness raising, mm-hmm. trying to reach people in the community who may be, as you say, seeing something in front of them in a family home, but they're not quite sure how to describe it. At yes. what level is it? good enough mm-hmm. and, and at what level is it bad enough yeah. to take action <laughs> that's that's the difficult um, question so, so neglect if we look at it it's the failure to meet a child's basic needs mm-hmm. um and that's whether it's your clothing mm-hmm. uh, appropriate clothing mm-hmm. so if a child was out in the winter and summer clothes or in the summer and winter clothes yeah. that type of thing um not attending to their hygiene to the point that it's harmful to a child um, so we have physical neglect as well. So that's, you know, you, you don't have an adequate shelter. Your house is not safe yes. for you or you don't have food mm-hmm. um, and it's not being provided for you. 
And also you're not being supervised. So if you're being left on your own a lot, inappropriately at a younger age, um, or it actually is around the child's needs. If a child doesn't want to be on their own and they're scared, um, you know, it, it's also about coming from a child's perspective. There's no sort of age at which it suddenly becomes okay. Um, or being asked to look after younger children as well. And it might be medical, you know, being left without... Uh, been getting help you might have hurt yourself not been taken to hospital um, or else medical in terms of you know you've got an ongoing condition it could be something like really bad eczema or really bad but something that's going to hurt you and harm you and say it got infected it could be have detriment to say your development so again th- those are different areas of neglect that people mightn't look so much are there many children who maybe you would find that are suffering from neglect but don't necessarily realize that they are being neglected yeah, I think one of the case studies that we would have and we would use is from a young girl who, who really felt that neglect was her fault because oh she was being told this is all because of you, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you know, you're what cause the problems in the home. So that's why it's so good to have somewhere like Childline where yes. some, you can go away and say, is this OK? Is this OK? I think that a lot of people accept the world that they're presented with. And if you don't know any other world outside of that, if that's your life then you tend to think that that's okay and you don't realize. So I think that this is, again, why podcasts like this are so important. If there's somebody listening, that they can go to all the resources that you're telling, you know, the websites, the the information and, and compare maybe and, and then really work out, no, this isn't mm. good. But mo- obviously moving on from that, there there's also, unfortunately, in our society, and again, with, with the times we're living in now with COVID, poverty is going to be something that is going to be endemic really you know with with it, it is anyway a bad situation would I be right and thinking there is there is a lot of children living in poverty but then obviously with covid a lot of people are going to be losing their jobs and that's going to have an impact on on children too isn't it yeah i mean i suppose for poverty what we know is that there's many children who are living in poverty and the parents are living in poverty yeah. who do their best of course, and do meet yes. the needs of their child yeah. um but it definitely is more difficult to meet the needs of your child mm-hmm. and it's more difficult to get the things that would make your child have a healthier life in terms of even diet. Yes. Um, we look at things like digital uh, poverty where even during lockdown where, you know, maybe schoolwork was being sent mm-hmm. on devices and assuming that there's, you know, tablets That's and laptops right, yes. and houses, assuming that there's enough Wi-Fi and electricity. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, to be honest with you, some people are living day to day to the point where they don't have the, mm-hmm. the money for electricity and I think we have to be you, and that's why when you design stuff yeah. you must design it with poverty in mind I and mean, there is you know we're looking at poverty strategies in Northern Ireland at the minute and I would encourage anyone who they can input into these strategies to talk to the families yeah. that are experiencing this and I suppose that's back to the other part of just the neglect piece mm-hmm. is that you know we can have educational neglect where some parents don't believe that education is that important or yeah. not sending kids to school um, and all of that has an emotional impact um, and also children who just don't feel loved and cared for and that's you know that's a separate thing yeah. but in terms of poverty I think that um, it's going to increase as you said mm-hmm. we're, we're, and I'm we've made a statement to Boris Johnson along with a number of other charities because it is going to be driven by policy yes. nobody can make more money yeah. but the extension of free school meals yes the uh, putting resources behind the community. We have seen community networks that step up during COVID that were not there before. Yeah. The people distributing the f- uh, food banks, the people out on the streets, mm-hmm. identifying families in need. We need to support those people and those uh, organisations and community groups yeah. to sustain this because poverty isn't going away. And Absolutely. as you said, um, people tend to think of poverty as people who are not working. Mm-hmm. Where actually there's a significant amount of people and families yes. living in poverty where one or two parents are working, mm-hmm. but their jobs are so low paid, their hours are irregular. Um, they also there's no progression routes, no. so they're going to be on minimum wage They've for the rest of their life. Continue. Yeah, I have seen that myself where people are working. This is the thing, you know, as well, that I've seen people working to themselves to the bone and the money they're making is not covering the rent. But Well, it just covers the rent and nothing else, really. And and then, you know, it is so difficult to see families struggling like that, especially when they're trying so hard. And as you say, those initiatives, the community, all of that, if the one thing that I suppose has come out of this very difficult time is the, the power of people and the kindness yeah. in the community. Um, I suppose that with, with that in mind you know it's nice to hear success stories it's nice to hear good things happening and and from you know your experience and what you've seen 
maybe you've come across well not maybe you have come across a lot of children who have been in terrible terrible situations have you any um have you a story that maybe would sh- would give somebody a bit of a glimmer of hope that if they're in a situation that they can come out of it or, uh, from from what you've seen over the years yeah we're very privileged when a young person or a family let us share their story yes and i know on our website um there are stories we try and illustrate that to show well what does that mean because yeah. it's all very well reading about this stuff but what does that look like as you say mm-hmm. so a, a young girl who was living um with neglect uh, that i mentioned earlier that she said that she was uh, told she was to blame for it yeah. and she said she just thought it was like a living hell for her mm-hmm. there was no one out there um it wasn't noticed if she was even in the house mm-hmm. the it wasn't noticed if she went to school and, and her parents were uh, misusing uh, substances so yes. again there was another additional issue there that was taking the attention away from parents and then from her being supported um and she was being yelled at as well and they were telling her they didn't love her and they hated her and oh, stuff so you know that whole sad. it's not just living with neglect it's living with the sometimes being feel like you're to blame yeah and she felt helpless um and she was at the point herself that um she was sort of doing a cry for help where she was harming herself oh, yes. so she mm-hmm. said she came she was referred to nspcc Lovely. um she and she hadn't food. told anybody about her substance misuse of her parents because she was quite a good student at school and she was yeah. doing okay. Mm-hmm. So there was no flags waving for people to say, oh, we've got an issue here. Mm-hmm. Um, but the person in the NSPC that she worked with, the practitioner the, the, who came and worked with her, noticed her body language, the way she was. And she was able to trust and build a relationship, to trust, to tell. Because uh, often children are afraid of what's going to happen, or young people. So she opened up and she got the confidence to let it out. And she got the support um, and she got the support for her, pa- you know, her parents would have been signposted as well. But more than that, she knew it wasn't her fault and that she had a pathway out of it with support. And she just, you know, she thanked us for, for being there for her. So that's what you want. I mean, I always that's say if it's one person's life like that, that, that can maybe open absolutely. up that doorway to a, a new pathway for her. That's enough. It's but we very, have hundreds. It's very emotional too. And it's lovely to see then the work that you're doing actually helping somebody and and i do think as well that that particular person with what she gained from from all of you she will give that out to others as well that she sees any because she is in a special position where she knows she'll be able to see somebody before anyone else that's in that situation and and she'd be able to give them advice and help because she got it from you so i think your i think your word spreads beyond just even the one person that you're helping yeah and i think we know uh in social media in different places people do describe how we've helped them yes. um, and maybe down the line they don't want to tell people even necessarily mm-hmm. now maybe in their 20s 30s yes. 40s they'll say I actually went to one of your centres mm-hmm. or you know and, and I've experienced that out in the communities where people say it and they'll say it discreetly because yeah. there still is you know difficulty yes. you know and, and that's why we're so privileged obviously we anonymise the cases we share on the on our websites mm-hmm. and that but these are all real children real young people that we have engaged with we'll have, we'll have worked with them to get that information to share and they'll have given us permission and we really are unprivileged yeah. that they have done that because that's their private world it is and they've trusted you but you're you're clearly doing something very very good because for people to come to you and get that advice and help and trust you that says that you're doing everything right and it's thank thank goodness for for that um you know for for your work and for you being there i know that you do a lot of local and national campaigns is there a recent campaign that you feel would you'd like to talk about in relation to what we've we've been discussing today i suppose uh, one of the most recent campaigns we had was to push out uh, more knowledge about our adult helpline yes. um we were approached by uh government in the uk to support a push out during covid because we realized that there was far less people normally like teachers uh, social workers, health visitors, everyone who would have engagement with families mm-hmm. and we're very concerned because there was beginning to see an increase in different types of reports of abuse to children and young people yeah. so we might know the number and we might know about the service but a lot of the community, until you need it, you might know about it, so we designed a social media campaign and that went out with a lot of ads um, and that was supported as they paid for to go out because we really want people it's the kind of number we want you to put into your phone Yes, we want you to save it in your phone so yes. you don't have to go looking for it mm-hmm. And uh, what we did was we wanted to also target people um, that mightn't necessarily usually 
uh, think of themselves as being involved in child protection or safeguarding the children. So we also offered out alongside that our training and um, online training. We offered a thing, a free course called It's Your Call. Yes. And it actually was aimed at people that go and deliver food or electricians, people that are going to be in people's homes to say, if you notice something, if you notice a home where the, you know, everything, the rubbish is everywhere, maybe there's uh, animal feces and things, different things that are just yeah. not acceptable for a child and the children in that home, please talk to us. And that's been hugely successful um, in terms of tapping into people who want to be part of keeping children safe yes. uh, and I know that will probably be you know we'll continue with that um, but we did have to put an extra push out before because of COVID um, it really was a time for everyone to open their eyes and, and look around them a bit more and know who to speak to to get help. Absolutely I mean I think people might feel that that because they're not say a social worker or not a teacher or not working with children on a daily basis that they don't have the sort of the 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 channels to go through and i think that campaign really puts it out there it's if you're an adult and you see a child in need it's it is your responsibility it is all our responsibilities to keep children safe so that's a fantastic um uh, campaign and it's on it's been pushed out on, on, social, on social media medias. mainly social media and there was paid for ads and that yeah. as well but if you go on the website as well you you know you go and see our posts around yes. it and, and if you follow us you NSPCC Northern Ireland and NSPCC there's a UK page as well um, you'll get to see our posts as they come out and you'll get to get that bit on going information you know that, that's brilliant a very very useful um, a campaign for people to know about thank you just to finish off this this podcast um, today Margaret I would say to you if I was a child now sitting in front of you and if there's any child listening to this podcast and I was suffering from abuse in my home what steps would I take now what would you say to me now where would I like exactly what's the first thing for me to do uh, talk to someone mm-hmm. and talk to someone you trust mm-hmm. and if there's no one in your life uh that you feel you can or it's safe to talk to, talk to us, talk to Chilean, message us. But I do know from supporting people over the years that sometimes getting those words out of your, your mouth may be so difficult. So we have places even within our website where you can draw, where you can, you know, colour in things, draw pictures. So when you come on to talk to us, you mightn't have to tell us, but you could have done a draw and it's in a safe place. It's in a locker online, create an account in Chilean for yourself. Do whatever you need to enable you to reach out and describe maybe how your life is um, and we will support you to find out what the options are and who what's the best pathway for you to get support. It also depends on your age and it depends the risk of the things that are happening in your life but we know that it's always, you know, it works better for people when they share it. Um, if you have somebody in your, your teacher, uh, an aunt you go to, uh, you know, your grandmother, your grandfather, whoever it is, there might be people in your network of family and friends that you know, I can talk to them. But also have a number of those people. So if the first person might be might be a bit overwhelmed by you telling them and they might say, oh God, you know, don't be worrying about that or it couldn't be that bad. Make sure you have other people you can t- talk to as well. And don't be put off by seeking help if the first person, even if it's somebody you love, they might just be overwhelmed by the fact you've shared it with them. So, and just always to remember, it's not your fault. Mm-hmm. That's great. It advice. is not your fault mm-hmm. and it will never be your fault. You're a child and you have the right to be safe and happy and supported and educated and loved. Margaret, that is lovely. And I think that's very good advice for anybody out there listening. There is obviously the website that you can get all the numbers and information on. Margaret, would you share the website? Well, the Chilines, uh, org dot uk. Yes. And our main website then with advice for adult helpline and other parenting guides and advice as well is at just nspcc.org.uk. Lovely. Thank you, Margaret. Um, thank you for your time and uh, the information you've given us today. Um, I really hope that this uh, first uh, episode of our podcast has, has reached out to somebody listening today and, and can help in any way. And we really, really hope that you join us for the second episode in our podcast series um, very shortly. Take care. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Don't be afraid at all. Don't be afraid at all Don't be afraid